record this session and I'm going to hand it over to Jay Pino for, uh, for his presentation. Jay, take it away. Thank you, Evan. Let me just uh, share my screen here and we'll get going. Um, can everybody see my screen pretty clearly? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, first of all, again, I uh, just want to welcome everybody and uh, thank, thank you for taking the time. I know everybody's busy kind of going back to programs, but, um, but I'm hoping to, to, to share, again, some concepts and some ideas with teaching methodology and technical parameters. Uh, I want to apologize in advance. I'm fighting a little bit of a cold. Luckily, it's nothing more than that. So if I cough a little bit or if I don't sound as clearly, just again, I apologize in advance. But uh, luckily, you guys, I mean, hopefully, you guys are going to be able to understand me uh, pretty good. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank, again, the USDA, Middle States, for the invitation. It's always a great honor to be speaking uh, in front of peers. I know there are a lot of great presentations that took place this week in the past few weeks. I also want to thank the, the National Tennis Center and Dunlop for, for the supports. Um, so let's get going. And do, we do have a pretty a packed agenda with the presentation today. Uh, we'll start kind of laying a foundation um, and then talking a little bit more in the details about developing a teaching methodology. And with the objective there, of course, is not necessarily for you to use my methodology. We're going to go into you know, a lot of details about my methodology, but it's just to spark your thoughts uh, to, so you can formalize your own or take a couple ideas from mine and uh, make yours more robust. Then we'll talk about uh, technical parameters and the application of my methodology um, when you know working on fundamentals for all the ground strokes for, uh, for the sake of time. We're not going to be covering the serve, uh, but all the, the main ground strokes uh, we'll cover. Then we're going to try to summarize and uh, open up for any questions that you may have. Um, because we're going through over you know, a lot of different concepts and material, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to, to ask, um, you know, at the end of each segment, I will try to open up for a question or two, just I'll probably limit it, you know, initially to a question or two, just to make sure I stay on time. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have more time for, for additional questions. So I have two main goals with my presentation. Uh, the first one is to, to share the key com components, right, be behind my teaching methodology and demonstrate how I apply it on different types of scenarios. Uh, as well as to share my views in terms of the technical parameters for ground stroke. So those are uh, clearly the two main goals that I have today. Um, and I would like to start this before getting into the details with a kind of a more of a broad discussion here. Um, I, I do see a few issues or areas that we need to do better in our industry. Uh, one being uh, our ability as, as coaches to develop fundamentals to the masses, right? To the large population of players that might want to be um, wanting to, to take, take up tennis for the first time or get back to the, to the sport. And we end up creating uh, what, what I've heard, you know, what, what I refer to uh, as tennis triers, you know, players that will take up the sport, you know, may have a hard time in the beginning and may, uh, may quit, okay? Uh, and our conversion into what I refer to as tennis players, I think can be higher. Right. By tennis players, I mean just someone who's going to be playing for a long time, maybe will play for the entire lives, regardless of the level uh, that they will, you know, get to. Um, also, another issue or area that, uh, that we, we face in our industry uh, is I, I work a lot of juniors at the National Tennis Center. And uh, as you work with juniors, of course, you have to work with parents. Uh, and I enjoy working with parents. But a lot of times, you know, we do have parents that are looking for very fast results and somewhat unrealistic expectations. So it's important that as part of our methodology, as part of our communication of players, parents, that we try to address those issues as much as possible. And I just wanted to kind of bring that forward first, because again, I think that a lot of the other things that we're going to discuss will hopefully help make a difference in these ideas. So just to get started, so what is a teaching methodology, right? In my opinion, a teaching methodology is, is a system, right, with some principles and procedures that will guide how you, as the pro, will go about your, your lessons. You go, you're going to uh, shape your delivery, right? Um, and what should be part of a methodology? I think there, you know, there are many components of a methodology. I'll go into detail about the components of mine, but I think... Uh, technical parameters for, for the strokes. I think it's something important. Uh, I actually took the time to document uh, my parameters for all the strokes 
and it just made me more aware of my own preferences. Uh, we'll talk about some concepts like the range of acceptability a little bit later on. Uh, it has to do with technical parameters, but it's again, I think it's important to, to have that as part of your methodology, as well as tactical concepts. Um, tennis, of course, is a game. So from, I think, very early on, as a player staking up our sports, they have to understand what they should, should not do um, based on their own strength and weakness, based on their level, etc. cetera. Um, behavior standards, I think, you know, my, I still work mostly with, with, with juniors, and I do believe that the character development component is something that is very important. So I think that uh, adding that as part of your methodology it's, uh, is something that, that, that is important. Uh, physical and mental skills, of course, the higher uh, the level of the player, the more important these will, will be, but even at a lower level, uh, some of these concepts can be um, introduced. And how are you actually going to put it together? How are you going to apply your own methodology? I think uh, in simple terms, these are kind of the starting points. At least it was the starting points when I was putting together my, my, my method. But I always like to start with a definition. I think it kind of gives you a sense of direction. And the definition of my methodology is the following. Right? It's utilize the simplest way to progressively move a player through the, through the developmental journal, uh, journey while developing his or her fundamentals, character, and love for the game. Um, I think the two keywords there are in red. It has to do with you know, keeping things simple and doing it in a progressive way. Okay. As I go through the rest of the presentation, as I show some, some of the videos a little bit later on, you see that a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is pretty, it's pretty simple. And again, it's everything is a sport of a progression. And I do have a, uh, one teaching belief um, that also helps me guide, help, help, helps guide me, my, my actions and uh, how I create lesson plans, which is a great player is someone who executes the basics right, or the fundamentals extremely well. Therefore, I must emphasize perfecting or mastering the fundamentals with my players. Okay, so again, if you watch me on court, regardless if it's a group session or a private, a lot of what I do is a consequence of, uh, of these, these definitions and the belief. So I think having that clear for you uh, is something important. Um, so now let's get into a bit more details about the, the other components of my methodology. Uh, starting with simple language, right? And we understand that, you know, especially as players develop, right? Tennis can get a little bit complicated, right? Uh, some words like kinetic chain and, 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 and things that for a player that might be less developed, they might mean very little to them, right? So I try to err in the side of simplicity. Uh, one phrase that I like to, to use to keep things um, to dumb it down for, for me is if you can explain simply, you don't understand well enough, I think. And, uh, and I try to use that um, on all, all lessons, on all groups, even on my high performance groups. Again, I try to keep the language fairly simple. Um, the other one is, again, the specific technical parameters. Like I said, again, documenting your preference, I think it's something important. However, uh, with technical parameters, and again, I was guilty of this, uh, probably you know, in the past more than nowadays, um, kind of almost like an obsession on how the strokes will look, right? Um, and yes, again, it's important that the stroke, the, the stroke has some sort of shape that you're looking for, okay? But it's ultimately you want to um, create, develop stroke flexibility, not just pretty strokes. And by that, meaning that the player is able to adapt his or her strokes based on the situation and it doesn't break down uh, as easily, right? Uh, also, tactical guidelines for shot selection, it's something very important. Uh, one concept that I like to use a lot of my players is the concept of directionals, okay? So in very simple terms, okay, assuming both players, again, in a singles match, both players are at the baseline, um, players will be hitting mostly cross courts from wide positions and looking to change directions from close to the center. Okay, so visually, right, if you break down the baseline into four zones, okay, A, B, C, and D, on zones A and D, players will be playing mostly cross, because of course there are exceptions to that. But in the beginning, when I'm explaining this concept uh, with the players, I try to make, you know, pretty black and white and really have them follow it to, to the T. Okay, so again, they'll be going cross courts from zone uh, A and D and looking to change directions when they're close to the middle. 
Also, one thing that is important when I'm working with the players on this concept is understanding what's an inside stroke and then what's an outside stroke. So in this particular example here, we have two right-handed players. I think, I think we have Novak here. Uh, of course, his backhand is his outside stroke here on the ad side. His forehand would be his inside stroke. So when the ball's coming to zone uh, C, more often than not, I try to emphasize changing with the inside stroke because it's easier to hit a crossed body than it is to hit away from the body, again, most of the time. Uh, so again, that's a concept that I like to work a lot with my players. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's important to, to, to have the, the tactical guidelines there as part of it. Now, adding on to the tactical, um, another idea that I like to emphasize is understanding your mold or your balance. Okay, so in very simple terms, okay, if the player has a good balance on a given shot, well, he or she can go for a good shot. Neutral balance, well, they're going to go for neutral shots. Bad balance, they're going to go for a bad or a basic shot, but hopefully they will make it, right? So how many times do we see our players uh, breaking that very simple guideline, okay, where they might have bad balance and they're still trying to come up with a pretty good shot and then mistakes uh, are piling up. Um, another component of my method has to do with how I set up drills, okay? Um, one thing that I've tried to incorporate fairly often, not always, okay? Uh, it has to do with adding something, a competitive element to it, okay? Um, players tend to raise their intensity and raise their uh, accountability quite a bit when there is some sort of competition, okay? Uh, I understand that there are gonna be some drills where we don't want that. We want the players to focus on just execution of whatever it is that we're working on without having to count or be concerned whether they're making or missing the shot. So there's, uh, we have to take that in consideration, but I do like to add a competitive element to the drills as much as possible, uh, ensuring that the drills have something very, very specific that the players have to know very clearly what's being worked on, okay? And sometimes I just ask, well, I might explain the drill, I might do a demonstration, and then I ask them, okay, well, what are we focusing on? Okay, and you know, you gotta make sure that uh, they understand so we're all on the same page before we start. One thing I work quite a bit with my staff at the National Tennis Center when I do staff training is, um, yes, it's important to have a good variety on your drills uh, to keep them fresh, but it's even more important, in my opinion, that we're focusing on the proper execution of the skill, right, not just on the drill itself, right? Sometimes um, I, I see that, uh, some, you know, we don't want to overcomplicate the drill and now the players are so concerned or so preoccupied with, okay, what do I have to do? I have to run around this cone, I have to jump over this. So sometimes it just, it, it does not um, add as much value to have drills that are very complex. Um, another con uh, concept that I like to do to incorporate all my drills has to do with asking the players to ca call out certain words, okay, depending on what I'm working on, um, before they hit or as they're hitting, depending on what the situation is. So, from, so for example here, uh, one drill I like to do quite a bit during warm-ups is what I call the split drill, where if, if I'm hitting with a player, okay, as my partner, as I'm about to make contact with the ball, my partner will be calling split and then executing a split step at that moment. Okay, just the fact that you have to call out loud, okay, it makes you a lot more aware of that particular thing that you're calling out loud and it helps in my opinion to internalize uh, and create a better again sense of aware awareness. Same thing with the strike zones. This is something that our friend Jorge Capistani uh, likes to use quite a bit. Uh, the four strike zones with strike zone number one, uh, meaning you're making contact with the ball below your knee. Okay, strike zone number two, it's in between your knee and your waist level. Strike zone number three is in between your waist and your chest, I'm sorry, and your shoulder. And strike zone number four is above your shoulder. So just having the players understand the strike zones and having them call uh, which number they're contacting the ball at, again, it just helps them develop the awareness, okay? Especially if you're trying to in, you know, emphasize a certain strike zone, maybe a three, for example, or two. Uh, another one I like to do quite a bit, again, is very, very simple up, back, and hold, where the players might be rallying as part of a warm up, and they have to call up, back, or hold as the ball is crossing the net. Uh, I will be calling up, back, and hold based on, based on the movement pattern that I have to do uh, given the shot that I'm receiving. 
Another one I like to do quite a bit has to do on what I'm working with the directional concept that I explained a couple of slides ago has, uh, is the cross and change where players might be uh, playing points and for every shot they hit when they're staying at the baseline okay, against another baseliner, they have to call cross or change. By change meaning if they're changing directions from where the ball is coming from and just making sure that the players are following the guidelines that I gave them early on. Okay, so these are again some simple concepts I like to use on the drills. Uh, in terms of uh, standards, I think having clear standards are also something uh, very, very crucial. Uh, and the first one has to do with how we as coaches um, communicate with the players and how we provide feedback to the players. I work with my staff quite a bit at the National Tennis Center on making sure that one, that we're focusing on less things. Okay, so it's better in most cases to try to go a little bit deeper into one or two areas than trying to accomplish 10 different things in a short amount of time because more often than not, we're probably not gonna be able to make a big dent uh, on any of those concepts. Um, you know, if you're focusing on less, we have a higher chance, at least in my experience. Um, another thing I find to be very important has to do with, uh, you know, I've been very guilty of this over the years and something that I'm still working on. Uh, we might see a player, you know, might be doing a drill or hitting, whatever it might be. They hit 10 great shots. We don't say much. Then they make a mistake and then we're jumping on the player, trying to correct him or her or say that what they should have done differently. Uh, so trying to emphasize, have a, a good balance between correcting and also emphasizing the things that they're already doing well. I think players will learn from, yes, we do have to sometimes stop and, and try to correct things, but also there's a, a great learning opportunity just to tell them, okay, this is what you're doing here is really good. Keep doing this. Okay? And I don't think that we do that enough. And that's something I, I try to, uh, to monitor with my coaching quite a bit. Um, player expectations. I think it's important uh, early on in the session at the National Tennis Center, we give the players a sheet Right? That, that has some guidelines of what we expect from them right? in terms of their behavior and, and on-court attitude, as well as some of the parents, right? uh, some of the guidelines that we have for parents. So I think it, it helps us to kind of be on the same page with that triangle of being again, the coach, the parents, and the player. So we're all on the same page. Uh, so setting the expectations from the get-go, I think, is also uh, helpful. And... How do I apply it, right? How will I get all these pieces and, and create something that, it's, uh, that gives value to the players? So I'm gonna give here an example uh, of a private lesson. You know, my, maybe it's a situation where I have a private player and I'm working on tweaking, making some sort of technical adjustment uh, with the player. So one thing I like to do first is to record uh, I understand that the use of technology sometimes can take too much time. Okay, so I try to err on the side of, again, simplicity. I don't spend a lot of time on, on my phone. Show, you know, if I'm recording something on my phone or on iPad, if you have play sites, you know, that's also a good tool. Uh, but recording can be helpful. Uh, I do have all my strokes, uh, actually on my, on my, on my iPad, to, to do a quick comparison uh, when I want to, isolate or point out something uh, to the players. And of course the goal is not for the player to hit exactly like me, but is to maybe show, okay, on this particular moment, right? You see how my record is on this position, whereas yours is here, to, especially when I feel that they are outside of the range of acceptability, which is something we're gonna talk in a little bit. Uh, at that stage, uh, once I'm able to analyze, compare, wanna find the root of the problem, Okay, what's the one tweak or adjustment I can make that will have probably the highest chance of uh, a positive outcome on an improvement? Okay, then again, I do like to break it down in progressions, keeping things simple by making sure that I create a scenario where the player can have some sort of some level of success uh, from the very beginning. It might be that I'm shrinking the courts. Maybe I'll bring the player to the service line. It might be that sometimes maybe I'll bring I uh, use a low compression ball. Okay, so making it easy first. Then it's a matter of staying on task, right? For continue focusing on one thing, um, adding more pieces and make it a bit more complex as the player shows that he or she is getting the, the idea, right? Adding more movements perhaps. 
then I do like to do uh, another comparison, you know, if, if it's a technical type of adjustment. Um, and then assigning homework. I think that is something that uh, I do quite a bit of my players, assigning homework bo both on and off the courts. Um, if it's shadowing, if it, whatever it might be, uh, I think there's a power to that to expand our uh, our lesson out, outside just that one hour or two hours, whatever it is that you have with that particular player. Um, so that kind of is the foundation for um, the, my methodology, right? Do, I, do we have any, any quick questions uh, about the methodology before we go into the technical parameters piece? There are no questions in the chat, um, but if somebody has something they'd like to ask quickly. If not, uh, I'll go. go and we can always come back to, to, to yep. questions uh, later on and we do have some time for it. Uh, so now we're going to be going over again the technical parameters and how I apply the methodology that I just described uh, to develop in my opinion you know at least try to develop sound fundamentals uh, with my players but before we do that just a few last considerations just to make sure we're all on the same page um, i think we would all agree that the top players they share many commonalities on their strokes right yes there are stylistic differences on their take back or the preparation or whatever it is but at certain moments okay maybe on the racket drop or on the contact point or an extension or a follow through we do see a lot of uh, similarities um, amongst the, the, the top players. Uh, what I said before about the range of acceptability, right? So we may have an idea of what a stroke should look like or function like, uh, and maybe your player does it a little bit different, okay? But it's you know still fairly close and it works well for him or her, then it's in most cases still okay. So we don't have to be kind of married with um, you know, the, pretty, the pretty stroke. Um, I'll only be referring to the, the hand, the, the role of the hands, right, on this presentation. So in other words, how is the racket going to be moving from point A to point B? Okay, I'm not uh, going to address full work or stances or things along those lines. I'm just focusing on um, how the racket is moving from point A to point B. And please assume that we're talking on a neutral shot where the player has some time uh, and is more or less organized. Okay, we know that things can look pretty different when they're in big trouble, okay, but we're going to focus more on a neutral shot type of situation. We also have to understand that there are some gender differences, okay, and we're going to, I'm going to address a little bit of that as we talk about the forehand, uh, as well as physical limitations where I might want to ask, you know, get a player to a certain position or get the player to do X, Y, or Z, but maybe physically he or she is not as developed or maybe, uh, maybe, they don't have the range of motion. So we have to be aware of that uh, to make sure we have realistic expectations. And, you know, just to make it clear, you know, even though I do work for the USDA, these are just my personal opinions uh, on the different strokes. These do not necessarily reflect uh, what the USDA may or may not uh, accept as the parameters for the strokes. So I will start with the one-handed backhand because I feel that there's a little bit of a gap there in terms of um, information out about effectively teaching the one-handed backhand. I have a one-handed backhand myself. Um, am I biased towards the one-handed backhand? Maybe a little bit. However, I, that doesn't mean I believe that most players should have a one-handed backhand. Quite the opposite. I do feel that nowadays uh, the two-handed backhand is, 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 it fits better for most players. However, some players are going to be better off on a one-hander and we have to be able to identify who those players are and then be able to teach effectively. Um, so for all the strokes that we're going to be going over in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the grip and some key positions okay, on the unit turn, on completing the loop, contact point, extension, and finish. Okay. So starting with the grip, again, anywhere between Eastern to Extreme Eastern, uh, usually you're going to be in good shape. Okay. Nowadays, uh, it, has, it has changed a little bit, in my opinion, where we do have some players with like a Dimitrov or a team that have pretty uh, classic or kind of more of an old school uh, back and grip. And they still, of course, have very good back ends. But if you look back a few years ago, we had more players that succeeded 
uh, that had great one-handed backhands with more of an extreme Eastern. And I'll show what that looks like. Guys like Gustavo Kirten, Gaston Gaudio, Justin um, Hannon, uh, they were close to an extreme Eastern. So just visually, right, we see here Roger, he has more of a classic Eastern where his knuckle is on bevel number one. You can see uh, the other knuckles a little bit more on a diagonal, okay? Uh, versus a guy like Gustavo Kirten, he's a little bit higher on bevel number one. The other knuckles are a little bit more aligned, okay? And, uh, and that helps a lot of times because it, it, can, it, it does give you a little bit more support as your hand is now behind the grip a little bit more. And I'll show a picture in a few slides to, um, to, to make that more clear. Uh, but on the unit turn, what are some of the things that we are looking for? Um, I would like to see the hitting arm slightly bent, the non-dominant hand high on the throat. Uh, now, how high should the racket be? Again, there is a range there, okay? On the one hand, the back end, uh, sometimes players can have pretty large takebacks. Okay, R Roger has kind of more in the meet, middle of the range, okay? But anywhere where we have the sweet spots somewhere around your eye level, I think it's pretty fair. Okay, a little bit higher, it's okay. A little bit lower, it's okay. But I, that's one guideline I try to give to the players in terms of when they finish their first move. Uh, in terms of now, as the racket is, go, is, is moving from the unit turn to the racket drop or what I call the pockets, right? As because the racket now gets close to the left pockets here. So the racket is gonna move on a semicircular shape on a C-shaped motion. Okay, uh, one thing that it's very important at this stage is making sure that the hitting arm straightens, right? And that is a straight hitting arm, okay? A lot of players that struggle with the one-hander, they have a difficult time kind of almost locking uh, the, the hitting arm straight at that stage, okay? You almost see like a little bit of a bent arm at that position, uh, which uh, can, be, can be an issue, okay? Um, Contact point. So position as they drop, they're swinging up to the contact. Okay, it's of course in front, away from the body. Okay, one thing I want to highlight here is on an extreme eastern grip. Okay, we can see very clearly here that Guga is able to make a fist. Okay, as he's making contact. So that means that most of his hand, okay, is actually behind the grip. Okay, which gives again a little bit more support and strength. Okay, uh, makes it easier to deal with the higher balls. Um, so at this stage, again, uh, the contact is away, it's in front. You still maintain a fairly straight uh, hitting arm, okay? The extension, okay, now the, the non-dominant arm starts to extend back as well as the racket is swinging out towards the target, okay? One thing that's very important at this stage is I like to emphasize this position that we see Roger here. The ball is way gone, okay, but Roger is still looking sideways. It's still, his chest did not turn. Okay, so being able to hold the turn in that position is something important on the one-hander. And the finish, uh, of course, can, or can vary based on the intention. Okay? But basically, we see t t three types of uh, finishing. Okay? It's going to be a bit more clear on the next slide. Okay? So I call the limited release, meaning the wrist didn't move too much. Okay, so at this, on this type of finish, maybe on a flatter shot or a return of serve, the strings are pointing out towards the targets more. On a partial release, okay, there's a little bit more use of the wrist there. Okay, now the butt cap is pointing down. And the full release, okay, now the butt cap is actually pointing to the other, to the opponent. Okay, now usually when players are trying to hit maybe a higher ball or a heavier ball, usually you see that type of finish. So again, any of the three is of course okay, it depends on what you're trying to, to do on a given situation. So what I'd like to, to do here next is just show some of simple drills that I've done, that I'd like to use with my players to develop uh, a one-handed backhand, okay? So again, I have searched this particular player when he was about uh, 11, okay? But that was the very first drill I did with him, okay? Is making sure he's splitting, turning, getting to the racket drop, and then swinging up from there, kind of lifting from the shoulder, okay? Uh, I, why do I have him starting at the service line? Well, because it's easier, right? It gives him a sense of success. Now, the next stage here, now we can see that I have him start from the unit turn. So he's splitting, turning, then doing a little bit more of the motion on his own, okay? So now there's a, there's a little bit more complex, you know, complex motion they're going as the player is showing progress, showing that he's doing or she's doing okay. We start 
okay, maybe backing up a little bit more uh, until we get to the baseline and make it, you know, close to uh, to normal with, with, with more more variability. Okay, now again, he's still uh, starting from the unit turn. Again, that's some, uh, I like to, to work with the players, making sure that the first move is, uh, is simple, right? That the hands are staying quiet, okay? Uh, another drill of, I find very, very helpful for one-handers, I think it's going to be the next drill here. It's a very simple deep ball, short ball, uh, where players have to understand on a one-hander, okay, uh, that even though they have more range of motion, right, they have more reach, okay, their strike zone is actually a little smaller because shots that are above the shoulder are going to be very difficult for a one-hander. So they have to make sure that they're working the legs really well so they're finding the ball within the right strike zone. And that simple drill... Uh, helps to to develop that sort of awareness of where do I have to be to be able to take the ball on strike zone, let's say two or three, again, close to the waist or a little bit above the waist. Uh, so some simple drills there that I like to use to work on fundamentals for the one-hander. Um, now let's go to the two-hander back. But before we go to the two-hander back, are there any questions about the one-hander that we want to uh, discuss? Anything? No questions yet. <laughs> if anybody wants to go and and, uh, and and ask a question in basically in person, uh, just raise your hand and we can go and, and call on you there if you if you'd like to. Sounds good. Uh, sure. so we'll, we'll keep like moving. Uh, yeah. So let's. Now the two-handed backing, okay, so same concept, starting with the grip, then going to key positions, okay. Uh, grip, again, there are many combinations that we see out there for two-hander, okay, but if you look at the best two-handers in the world, more often than not, you're going to find dominant hand on continental and non-dominant, either eastern or semi-western. Um, so on the unit turn, what are we looking for? Uh, the sweet spots eye level okay uh, just like i said before again it's a little easier to do it on the one hander on the two hander i'm sorry because uh, it tends to be more compact okay uh, another find another thing that i find to be very important doing the first move is making sure that that as the player finishes this first move uh, we either have the racket close to being on edge meaning the edge of the racket is pointing forward or the face of the racket is slightly open okay if the player finishes this first move and the face of the racket is very closed okay usually that's telling me that he or she has a fairly extreme grip there that I may need to look at. Um, then as the player finishes the unit turn and the racket is, as he's completing the loop or she's completing the loop, okay, they're going to get to the racket drop position here. So one thing I emphasize quite a bit of the players, um, again, that's not exclusive to the two-handed back and but we're going to use the two-handed back in here to, 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 to discuss it, is that the racket has to go through three stages, okay? Uh, the racket right now is below the hands. Okay, the head of the racket is below the hands as they swing up to the contact. Okay, now the racket is more leveled with the hands. Okay, and then after, right, as they're extending, the tip of the racket is now is above the hands. So there's a lifting motion that takes place there with the non-dominant hand that will help to generate the spin. Uh, now, one thing I want to emphasize here in terms of the contact points. Okay. Uh, some players who have, again, the arms very straight at the contact. Some players who have more of a bent arm. Uh, that is something that I don't emphasize a ton, okay? Uh, it's for you to be able to get the contact out in front with a very straight arm. Is, uh, it requires a bit more upper body strength, in my opinion. Um, and it's, it's, it, it is just tough to do it all the time. So if they have a little bit of a bent arm on the contact, that is something that I, I don't sweat over it. Um, the extension again, like I said, the, the tip of the racket is above the hand. They're extending out towards the the target until they finish. Again, based on the intention. Uh, but more often than not, we're going to see again elbows away from the body, the tip of the racket pointing down. Um, so those are again simple and uh, most of the, the parameters that I look for on a two-hander. Okay. Now, same idea here. Let me just show a few videos that I like to uh, of some drills that I like to use 
to develop fundamentals with my players. So what we're going to do here, we're going to see the player is going to start, we're going to get to the racket drop position. We're actually working on two things at once here, okay, which I don't normally do, but for the sake of demonstration, uh, we're actually working on the racket drop, okay, and also the extension. So you can see that there's a little bit of a pause there after uh, Ronit hits the ball, okay, he's getting to the drop, he's going to hit, okay, a little bit of a pause, right, until the ball kind of bounces on the other side. So that allows him to see if the racket is actually going out towards the target more, right? So if he's extending. So a couple more. Uh, so now again, he's now finishing the swing uh, as one from the, from the drop, okay? A couple more here. But you can see that again, I'm doing a drill. If I'm working on, on this concept of the player, uh, make, either making a technical adjustment. I honestly probably will do it at this pace. It's not the fastest drill. It allows him or her right, to, to do the right thing. So now we're actually going from the unit turn. So just from the unit turn, he's completing. Okay? And as the player again shows uh, more, more progress, right, as he's or she's doing what you want them to do, we start backing it up. We start making it more complex, more realistic. Okay? But again, I'm just showing kind of the entire progression. I don't necessarily do the, the whole thing, you know, starting always from the service line. Depending on the needs, I might start from the baseline, but maybe from the unit turn. Okay? Maybe I, if I need it, I will regress it. I will bring the player forward. Okay? But just for the sake of demonstration, I'm showing you more, a more complete type of progression. Until you get to a point where we uh, will add more movement. Okay? So now the player is going to be kind of moving three different patterns. Um, Actually, that's going to be the next drill. So now he's going kind of full swing, just kind of uh, allowing the player to complete and put everything together. Okay, on the next one, actually now adding more movement. So he's going to be moving three different directions. So going along the baseline, giving some ground, backing up, and now taking some ground, moving diagonally in. Okay, so going wide, uh, deep and short. So then maybe the next progression would be maybe with random feeds or racket feeds. Okay, so... That again are some of the simple drills I like to to use to develop again sound fundamentals for the two hander. Now moving on here with the back and slice. Okay, so same concept from the grip to key positions. Grip, no big surprise, right? Being as close as possible to continental gives you more flexibility. Uh, now on this first move on the unit turn, what are some of the things I'm looking for? Uh, the non, I'm sorry, the hitting arm fairly, uh, sli slightly bent. Again, I like to see the head of the racket fairly high, kind of almost resting on top of the non-dominant shoulder, okay? Uh, another thing I find to be important is making sure that the non-dominant hand is fairly high on the throat of the racket. Players that have a two-hander have a tendency of trying to hold a little bit lower, so I try to kind of move that up a little bit more. Uh, it kind of helps with supporting the, not just the, the weight of the racket, but also kind of understanding the concept of sep separating the two wings, which happens as they go through the rest of the stroke. Okay, so on the forward swing, kind of it's a high to medium swing path. Okay, a lot of times the racket gets fairly horizontal at this stage. Um, if you look in slow motion, uh, it happens quite a bit. Uh, contact, again, in front, away from the body understanding that because we're going to be close to continental or continental, the contact is not as far in front as to, let's say, an extreme eastern, um, if you had, a, you know, on a top spin back end, if you're, uh, as a comparison. The hitting arm gets fairly straight, uh, still maintaining the body sideways, allowing the non-dominant arm to swing back to maintain the balance. Um, the extension, another piece that I find to be very important, ensuring the body is staying sideways, minimizing the swing going across the body, okay, especially early on as they get better. Yes, sometimes that will happen, um, but early on I try to maintain the, the, the swing path on that same plane, okay. Uh, and the finish, again, depending on what the intention is, but it's usually kind of a slightly a, a, a U-shaped motion where the racket is going to be going from high, medium, and then high again. Okay, so, and that usually helps you to elevate the ball and give a little bit more uh, shape. Uh, just because it's a slice, it doesn't mean you have to skim the net. Um, so, a couple of drills here um, that I'm going to show for the, for the back and slice. For the back and slice, one thing I like to use a lot is the, the alleys. Um, it gives a nice sense of uh, you know, direction, 
and it, it prevents the player from pulling across because if they are pulling across, there's a higher chance that they're not going to be able to keep the ball in the alley. Um, so I like to use the alley quite a bit. Of course, I could have started him from the unit turn or I could have started from the service line. But just for the sake of demonstration here, I'm just kind of doing um, further stages of the progression. So now move him back and up a little bit. So he has to change the amount of extension that he, he puts on the ball and the, even the, the height on the, on the slice as well. But the alley does give the nice sense of, of uh, forward direction that it's important on the back and slice. Uh, and last but not least, we will talk about the forehand. I wanted to leave the forehand last because there will be some uh, a little bit deeper explanation on the unit turn. I'm going to go over to different options. Oh, I, 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 the closing day on the 14. We do have some questions on the backhand, so I don't. Sure. Um, so one question from Courtney, how do you know when to teach a one-handed backhand? Um, yeah, so one of, the things that I, uh, one of the things that I look for um, when I'm potentially considering changing someone from a two-handed to a one-handed is the player's age. Uh, you know, of course, the younger the player, the easier it is to make some of these changes. And by young, I don't mean like seven years old necessarily, but if someone is... 14, 15, you know, changing from a two-hander to a one-hander, it's probably going to be one of the biggest changes a player can make in their game. Oh, so uh, that's one of the factors, the age. Uh, another factor that I look for is if their two-hander is very he's kind of stuck, right? And if, if he looks very dominant arm dominant, Okay. Some players who kind of muscle through with their dominant arm, and those are might be those are kind of going to be the players that I might experiment on a one-hander. Again, assuming that their you know their two-hander is just not very good. Um, so those are those are again some of the criteria that I that I like to consider to explore uh, a potential change. And one yeah. other um, back in the day, a forward. Release on a one-handed backhand was a no-no. It was taught that if you open up your shoulders too much, you lose control. What has changed? What makes it okay now? Uh, on a two-handed backhand or a one-hander? One-handed. Oh, on the one-hander, no, it's very important, in my opinion, to keep the body sideways longer. Um, so as I, as I mentioned in some of the previous slides, I can go back real quick. Uh, you know, but, but maintaining this position here, right, longer, it's, in my opinion, very, very important. So rotating too early, uh, I do not advocate for that, especially when you're, when you're learning, right, when you're teaching uh, early steps of the one-hander. So maintaining the body sideways longer, it's highly advisable, in my opinion. Any other questions? Uh, we can hold the next two questions till later. Sounds good. Um, okay, so now going with the forehand. Uh, so again, same idea, starting with the grip and then key positions. Okay, uh, grip anywhere between eastern to semi-western. It's advisable, right? Again, yes, it's possible to hit with a more extreme grip like a western, uh, but it can create some limitations. So um, depending on the player's body type, the age, um, maybe you want to consider making some sort of adjustment, but again, it's, it's not a mandatory thing. Um, on the unit turn, okay, so on the unit turn, I want to spend a little bit of time on, the, on this because I'm going to talk about two different options, okay? One is what I refer to the tip, right? By tip, I mean the tip of the racket, okay, vertical, and the other one is the tip forward, okay? A lot of the commonalities that are commonly associated with the tip vertical People refer to the WTA forehand and the tip forward, the ATP forehand. Okay, I'm not a huge fan of these terminologies, WTA and ATP forehand, because we're going to see many female players that have uh, what's referred to as the ATP forehand and vice versa. So I don't think that is a very descriptive way to um, explain the stroke or, 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 or talk about it. So I like to use the word, the terminology tip vertical and tip forward, and that's what we're going to be using on the next few slides. Okay, but on the unit turn, what are we looking for? Regardless if, if it's a tip vertical or tip forward, we like to see the racket above the hand, uh, the elbows rise comfortably away from the body, 
the non-dominant arm close to being parallel to the baseline to make sure you have a good turn. Um, again, how, how high should the racket go? Again, some people go pretty high on the forehand. Again, I like to use either the sweet spots or uh, the grip of the racket about eye level uh, as guidelines, right? So to keep the player within the range of accept accept acceptability. Okay, so going a bit more specific here on the tip vertical, okay? Uh, when we see this on the first move on, on the forehand, okay, usually some of the commonalities that we tend to see are the, the shape or the size of the swing tends to become a little bigger, okay, so because the, the, the head of the racket gets away from the player more, okay. Uh, the stroke doesn't become necessarily stiff, but the wrist doesn't move as much, okay. So that can be a good thing because it can be a bit more stable, okay. But the side is that it might limit a little bit the ability to accelerate okay, if the wrist is too stable. Okay? Uh, one way I like to explain uh, on this type of take back is that they, the player will lead the take back with the tip of the racket, meaning the tip of the racket will be the piece of the racket closest to the back curtain, and they will lead the forward swing with the buck cap. That will be more visible in the next few slides. On the other hand, on the tip forward, okay, some of the common hours, you can clearly see the tip forward, meaning the tip of the racket is pointing forward as the player completes the first move, okay, the unit turn. Um, some of the common hours that we see here is these tend to lead to a uh, shorter take back, okay. Uh, the wrist becomes more alive, okay. There is going to be more use of the wrist, which can maximize acceleration, but it can also create some instability. Uh, so the way I like to explain this to my players is they lead with the buck cap, meaning the buck cap is the piece of the racket that is closest to the, the back curtain. And then they will start their initiate their forward swing also by leading with the buck cap again, and this will become more visible in the next few slides. Okay. However, regardless of which type of setup they have, if the tip vertical, tip forward or somewhere in between, they will pretty much end up right here on the solid racket drop position like we have Rafa here, where the head of the racket is below the hand, butt cap is pointing forward. Um, now the difference is that on the tip vertical type of setup, the tip, <coughs> excuse me, the tip of the racket, right, will point back to the back curtain much sooner. On the tip forward, it will keep pointing to the side much longer. Okay, it will be uh, clear on the next picture. You can see here that as the two ladies are completing uh, their take back, you can clearly see that the tip of the racket is the piece of the racket that is closest to the back. Okay, so the racket gets away from the body a bit more. Is that incorrect? Absolutely not. Is breaking the plane uh, necessarily incorrect on the forehand? In my opinion, I don't think so. Okay, it depends on what the player uh, needs and what works for the player. Now, if there's a, there, there's a huge issue with breaking the plane, yes, then we can try to minimize it. But, um, but anyway, so this is just a visual example of the vertical setup, how they're leading with the tip of the racket versus on the tip forward, okay, the racket, the tip of the racket tends to point out to the side much longer. You can see that it's pretty late in the swing, okay, the ball is right here, and Roger has not even laid his wrist back yet. So that's what I said, we lead with the take back on the way back, and then we lead with the take back on the way forward. Uh, now the contact, it's in front and away from the body, right? Um, now one thing I like to emphasize here is the role of the left arm, okay, I think it doesn't get the the talk and the credit that it deserves. Uh, I call the left arm or the non-dominant arm, the brakes, right? So if one of, it's applicable on a one-hander back in, on, uh, on the back and slice, if it's a one-hander, of course, and as, as well as the forehand, right? If we lose the brakes, meaning if this arm gets out of the way very early, right, it can lead to some problems. So I like to emphasize keeping the left arm and the upper body pretty quiet uh, during the hitting stage. Um, the extension, right, again, I like to use the picture of Rafa here because I don't think he gets the credit he deserves with his extension because, you know, because of the way he finishes, okay, but he does a great job, of course, going and allowing the racket out towards the target before he finishes. Um, again, which the finish can be anywhere between waist and 
shoulder or even above the head, depending on what the uh, intention is. Okay. Now, just a couple quick videos here. Okay. Uh, that again, I'm emphasizing. I'm gonna add a few other concepts here that I like to incorporate on the drill. So right now, again, I have the player starting from the drop. I like to do this again, especially if the player has a hard time generating spin, making sure they're getting to that good racket drop first, just so they can feel uh, how the racket should be moving from that position on. Okay. Or if I'm tweaking a player from a tip uh, vertical, okay, to a tip uh, forward, okay. I like to, for, for them to understand by just doing some shadow swings. I'm a, I'm a fan of shadow swings. Again, if done correctly, if done paying attention. Uh, so now what we're going to have the player do here is kind of on a, a some more of an in-between. He's not starting on the unit turn, which will be this, but he's not starting from the, from the racket drop either. So he's starting on a halfway position. You can clearly see that the tip of the racket is still pointing out to the side. So he did not lay his wrist back yet. Okay, so now he's gonna start from the unit turn. Okay, you can clearly see that he does have a tip forward type of setup. Okay, uh, and again, as the player is showing progress, we'll start moving him back, right? Until they're putting it all together. Okay, um, another variation here, again, mixing the, the one shadow and then one hit. So the player can really feel how the racket is moving uh, without having to be concerned about hitting the shot and then the next ball, he goes ahead and then hits the ball. So it's another variation I like to use depending on, on what the need is um, until again, we start making our way back, okay. Um, I'm a, again, I, I'm a big fan of working on this first move again, uh, the, the, on the unit turn on all strokes, making sure that the hands stay quiet. You see that his hands do not move very much. Okay, it's literally just a turn, okay. Until now he's at the baseline, okay. Now I'm adding some more movements, okay and making, of course, more realistic. Uh, again, with a player at this level, would I do all these progressions on most of this? No, right? But again, I just for the sake of demonstration, showing different options of drills I've done a ton of times with this particular kid for many years. Um, so to summarize, right, I think um, defining your teaching methodology is something, to my, in my opinion, to, that, is, that is crucial, right? Um, and hopefully you're able, you're able to get uh, some ideas from mine so you can uh, add to yours. Again, mine is not, nothing, nothing more than a, com a compilation of things that I've seen from other coaches, uh, things that I've done myself and worked well from what some other coaches done with me as a player. Um, and I think it, it can help you create a stronger identity as well. Uh, simplicity, right? As you could see on a lot of the drills or the terminology, uh, keeping it simple is often the best way to go. Um, the one thing, meaning focusing on last things, that's something I worked a lot of the staff at the National Tennis Center, right? Accomplish more by focusing on last aspects. It's a little bit counterintuitive sometimes, but um, it's powerful. Right? Focus on last thing and get better on those things and then you focus on more. Um, focusing on the basics, right? There's, I don't think players are ever too old to, to get better with their fundamentals as long as they're willing to put in the time Right, uh, it's it, it's doable. Um, progressions, right? I think it's it's probably the best way to teach uh, many things. You can just learn, think about how we learned how to to walk, right? We don't just walk one day, wake up and we're jogging, right? We're uh, taking, we're crawling, taking then one step. Again, it's everything is a progress progression. Same thing with with talking, right? So I think it's a, it applies to how we teach tennis as well. And I really hope I was able to accomplish the two goals in my presentation, which again were to share the key components behind my methodology and, uh, and share my views of the tackling parameters for the ground strokes. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We have about five minutes. Uh, I also listed here my email address in case, you know, there's not enough time to answer everybody or if you just want more clarification on anything, I'll be happy to, to to try to answer your questions. And thank you again for, for being here. Again, thanks again to the USDA Middle States for the invitation. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Yep. We do have two questions about drills. Uh, yes. Do you use targets for basic drills? And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just tell them both to you. The other one was what's the percentage of dead ball versus live ball drills that you do? Uh, 
great question. So in terms of targets, yes, I, I'm a big fan of using target zones, right? Again, very rarely you're gonna see me putting one little cone there. Okay, you gotta hit this cone. Uh, that's extremely difficult. Uh, even with high level players, right? We have to teach them to hit to areas, to hit to target zones. So uh, yes, definitely incorporate some target zones on most of the drills. Um, and in terms of the balance between dead ball and live ball, again, depends a little bit on the level. Um, but uh, in a lot of the groups at the NTC, we try to kind of have about a third of the, the class where we're doing drills, third live ball, and another third playing points. Again, yes, there's some, you know, sometimes the drills um, might incorporate even some live ball. So my, maybe the live ball portion will be longer uh, than, than a third. But, uh, you know, rough, the, you know, in general terms, again, roughly a third or 25% to a third of the time, depending on, on the group and depending on what the need is. All right. Any, any other that's that's it, Jay. Uh, again, if, if you have any questions uh, after this, feel free to uh, to shoot uh, Jay an email. I'm sure he would love to hear from you guys. And uh, you know, it's great to hear. We've had this this common theme with when we have coaches and player development sessions. Is uh, there's a lot of collaboration between coaches and getting input, getting input, and getting ideas from other coaches. So it's great to hear that common theme throughout these is collaboration with everybody, um, which which is awesome to hear. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of a uh, lot, lot of positive uh, vibes coming from you in the in the chat, Jay. But uh, I just wanted to to thank you from uh, from USTA Middle States. This is a ex this is an exceptional session. Um, so such great content, um, and uh, you know we we uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, you coming through and presenting. And even though you're a little under the weather, um, and it's it's definitely been an extremely helpful thing. And uh, for everybody out here, uh, we will have this as a uh, as a recording. So we will be posting this uh, online as well, but, uh, but Jay, we can't thank you enough. And uh, you know, we, we really appreciate you coming on and, and giving us this presentation. Uh, it's my pleasure. Again, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, please uh, email me if you have any, any further questions. Um, you know, I'm a tennis geek. So I always like to talk tennis. And uh, again, it's, it's always a great honor to, to talk in front of my peers. So thanks again for the invite. And again, sorry if I sounded a little bit, uh, congested there, but I think it was clear enough. No, you, you, you sounded great. And so, yeah, we, we appreciate everybody uh, logging on the call. We had a great, uh, great turnout for this one. Um, and uh, we have a, a tournament director training tomorrow at noon. And then we also have Kahoot Trivia Night tomorrow night at 8 p.m. So please make sure to sign up for that. There will be prizes given out to the winners. Uh, but with that being said, we'll adjourn for this meeting. And uh, we hope to see you again at a, another session down the road. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.